soccer career at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I know everybody can do that. So when he graduated, uh, he decided that he needed more challenge. Uh, he came to the U.S. to work with uh, Dr. Gary Anderson at Davis, where he finished his uh, master's degree. Um, then he wasn't sure he wanted to go full time to research. So he came to see Adam uh, Kisling, he spent some time at Harvard. That was enough for him to uh, be convinced that he needed to uh, continue with research. Uh, he did his PhD at the University of Massachusetts with, uh, in Rubble. And he started this uh, new path on looking at calcium uh, regulation in, in eggs. And it's fair to say that he uh, actually has done uh, groundbreaking work in the mammalian egg and the role of calcium. And so we, today we're going to hear about um, the initiation of regulation and function Thank you, Jose. Thank you. Do you hear me? Well, I want to thank the very kind introduction. And obviously, Argentinians like to pass the ball to each other, so I'm sorry about <laughs> that. Uh, that's the only reason that I'm here. But also, I want to thank Anne and, of course, Carol, and they organized this. And it's always nice to see a lot of old friends and also some new friends. So, uh, unfortunately, I want to say that my father really wanted me to follow soccer, but I decided that uh, it was too tough. So science, I think, is equally tough, but uh, maybe more accessible. Uh, so I'm going today to show you a little bit of several research projects that are ongoing in my lab, because the background here is, is mixed. So I like to show a little bit of basic research and as well as some potential applications for human IVF. So as Lisa was uh, presenting her information in regarding signaling uh, or signals that induce the initiation of maturation, I want to talk about signals that trigger the initiation of development. And as you all know, most of mammalian species, except the dog, ovulate a metaphase two stage. And to exit from this stage, it takes calcium oscillations or calcium rises. And obviously, the initiators of this work were the Lionel Jaffe and others at uh, Woods Hole and many other people don't follow that. And as you can see, this is a typical rise that you see in, in the sea urchin egg. And also, uh, you can see that oscillations or calcium rises are present throughout, or is a universal signal, because you also see it in xenopus fertilization and in mammals, <coughs> it's also evident. Now, as you can see, there is a clear difference. In most non-mammalian species, you have a single rise, whereas in most mammalian species, you have oscillations. So the initial finding was that fertilization induces calcium release, and that calcium release triggers egg activation. Now the question that arose then was, what is the signal, or how does it start? So there were three theories that were put forward over the last 25 years, and the conduit theory said essentially, says essentially that sperm opens up the channel and induces intracellular calcium increase from that channel. That this theory pretty much is out in mammals because if you inject calcium, you do not get activation. The two most common or favorite theories have been the receptor theory and the fusion theory. So the receptor theory says essentially that the egg is a somatic cell, or like a somatic cell, in which you engage, or the sperm would engage a receptor in the membrane, that receptor would sort of signal through a pathway similar, or like Lisa described, triggering calcium release through PLC. Now, this theory is very current and very possibly the case in Sierrachins and in Xenopus because upon fertilization, you see an increase in the signaling pathway that takes place here. For example, you see sarcos correlation, tyrosine kinase correlation, you see plc gamma activation. However, this is not the case in fertilization. Lisa and others, Carmen Williams, have shown that if you inject dominant negative product of these signaling pathways, you actually do not block fertilization. So in 1985, Brian Dale and Carl Swan in the 90s, uh, uh, Jim Robles afterwards and our lab, have supported a different theory. And the theory that we support is that sperm fuses with the egg and upon fusion, it releases a product. And this product is responsible for the initiation of the oscillations. So this theory has been called sperm factor. Now we submitted a couple of grants in the early 90s and were rejected because we were considered an artifact. However, things really changed when ICSI came around. Because ICSI said that you could bypass every single membrane, inject this sperm, and trigger oscillation. So ICSI really brought up in front this theory. The second very significant piece of evidence 
came from the fact that you can inject sperm extracts. You break the sperm, you inject it, and you trigger oscillations. So now, with this piece of evidence done by a lot of people, essentially we're, we produce a significant step, which we said that the, sp the sperm deliver a factor called the sperm factor to trigger plasma oscillations. So the subsequent question was through which pathway? And somatic cells have obviously this capacity, they have a PLC, they have PIP2, upon stimulation in most cases of a G protein or a uh, tyrosine kinase uh, ligand, induce IP3 production and IP3 through the uh, IP3 receptor, which is a, a calcium channel ligand binding uh, area in the ER, triggers calcium release. Now, Rindy Jaffe, this is advisor, and as well as uh, Brad Stitt, have shown that in synapses and in C urgents, you can actually measure an increase in PIP2 levels or in, in PIP, PIP2 metabolism and IP3 mass after fertilization. However, we do not have this benefit of measuring IP3 in eggs. So how can we know that there is IP3 production involved? Or the IP3 receptor is involved? And then came a very interesting paper in 1992 by Sanichi Miyazaki, which showed that if you block the IP3 receptor, you block fertilization. So that paper said that this pathway was very important in fertilization. As well, if you block PLC by inhibitor of PLC, you also block fertilization. Lastly, one thing that we are really pursuing very importantly is IP3 receptors overexpress. Uh, mouse eggs overexpress the IP3 receptor. And as you can see, only in 12 eggs you can detect the IP3 receptor and metaphase 2 eggs. If you fertilize, that receptor fully disappears. In order for this appearance to take place, the only ligand that induces that is IP3. So indirectly, you can assume that there is IP3 production because the IP3 receptor is gone. So this path, this set of experiments led us to the current model, which is there is a sperm that binds and upon fusion, and this was also shown that there is a delay between the fusion and the initiation oscillations. So it releases a product called sperm factor that triggers persistent or periodical IP3 production, we don't know that, and then triggers calcium oscillations. So they, what I want to show you today is some data on what is the sperm factor, is there a role for PLC data, which is a new PLC discovery in sperm, and then investigate the role of IP3 receptor in mouse eggs, in the function of the oscillations. So one prerequisite for this sperm factor, if it is truly a conserved mechanism, is that it must be able to, in, or to work in different mammalian species. And as you can see, if you inject pig sperm factor into mouse eggs, you get oscillations. And if you inject mouse sperm factors into mouse eggs, you get oscillations. Now you can see this pig sperm factor seems to have a lot more activity because with 0.5 megs per milliliter or micrograms per microliter, you trigger oscillations, whereas the same concentration of mouse sperm doesn't do it, mouse sperm factor. Now, if you now inject the whole pig sperm into a mouse egg, you get oscillations. Likewise, if you inject the mouse sperm into a mouse egg, you get oscillations. But again, in agreement with the findings of different activity or amounts, you can see a single pig sperm, despite the similar size, triggers significantly more rises than the mouse sperm. Interestingly, if you take this product and you put it into frog extract, you also trigger an identical calcium release to what fertilization in the frog would do, suggesting that this product is highly conserved. Because pigs have a lot more activity than mouse sperm, we chose the mouse, the pig sperm, to uh, fractionate this product. Now, the earlier reports, or most of the reports, have shown that if you take a sperm, either hamster or pig, they, are, they have been the most commonly used, and you freeze and thaw it, and you collect the soup, and you inject the soup, you get oscillation. This is what's called sperm factor. Then others manuscripts from Perry's lab and Yanagamachi's lab show that if you take that pellet and either you mm -hmm. sonicate or treat it with ETT and then you inject the soup, you have activity. And in the mouse, it appears that the DT treatment depletes the calcium activity from the sperm. However, in pig, this is not the case. So it appears then that pig sperm, or most mammalian sperm, have an endless supply of sperm fat. No, I can only think that all sites are insatiable in their desire to have calcium. <laughs> so to activate and proceed into uh, development. But the only way that we could extract all the activity from sperm 
was by doing a short treatment with pH 11.5. So we took this intact sperm, we treated it with pH for 15 minutes, and then we collected the supernatant and the pellet. When we collect the supernatant, we extract all the material, and the pellet now, the sperm has lost all its activity. So we denominate this as a cytosolic fracture. So thick sperm cytosolic extract, or the high pH soluble extract. And we wanted to start to see whether what is the molecule, the molecular composition of these extracts. The first thing that we did is we compared taking these two extracts to, to see whether they could activate eggs at very low amounts. And as you can see, if we inject 0.05 micrograms per microliter, we can activate eggs. And these actions are due to calcium because if we put bacteria, we block. Then what we did is we took these two extracts, the cytosolic and the pH, and we fractionated through two different columns, sucrose 12 and hydroxyl apatite column. And upon fractionation, you can see that the activity comes off in exactly the same places. So suggesting that these molecules, even though they may have different locations within the sperm, may have the same molecular composition. Because there was PLC activity, we said, can we block calcium oscillations by blocking PLC activity? And we use U73122, which is a PLC inhibitor, as you can see, blocks. It's analog, inactive analog does not do it, in both fractions, the cytosolic extract or the pH extract. Then we ask, because a lot of people say that this is very uh, promiscuous inhibitor, we determined that the sperm factor, both the pH and the cytosolic, have PLC in vitro activity, and actually the U73122 inhibits this activity whereas the inactive analog does not do it. We also took these two extracts and we did an in vitro PLC assay looking at the sensitivity to calcium. And as you know, all the PLCs in order to function require a certain amount of calcium, but what it appears to be significant is at what calcium, fun at what calcium concentration and function. And as you can see, a lot of the activity is around one micromolar or less of calcium. And that is a special sign of a special PLC. Most PLC need in the levels of 30 to 100 micromolar calcium to work, or at least higher than 10. And we see significant amount of activity at less than one micromolar. Now, this, of course, has been one of the characteristics of PLC zeta. So we think our fractions do contain PLC zeta. Now, the other thing that is interesting, and you keep this in mind, this is the regular soluble sperm factor. This is a pH extractable sperm factor. There is fourfold difference in the specific PLC activity of these fractions. And we still don't know why that is, but it may suggest a function during fertilization. So as I was mentioned, eggs and sperm have a lot of PLCs. The question is, which one is it? Lisa here and other people have demonstrated and a lot of this, and I will show a in a little bit in a, in, a, in a second, that a lot of these PLCs do not by themselves, or if you inhibit it, their activity, do not block fertilization. But there came a new PLC, PLC Zeta, that was discovered in 2002 by Tony Lai and Carl Swan. And as you can see, all of these PLCs have two, the catalytic domains that are critical, the X and Y, and then they have a variety of other domains but PLC seems pretty, PLC zeta seems pretty bare actually. It has the catalytic domain, has the EF Hans domain, then our calcium binding and location domain, and a C2 domain, and it's also a calcium binding domain. PLC delta, which is considered the most primitive of all the PLCs, it has all the similar extractors, but in addition has this pH domain, this plex homology domain, that it allows to relocalize to the plasma membrane. So we wondered, because this PLC zeta is test specific, we wonder what it was present in our fractions. And as you can see here, there are several, and we have done, and other people have done many studies to demonstrate that this is not the case. And one significant finding here is that if you inject PLC zeta RNA, you trigger beautiful sperm like oscillations. Obviously, other PLCs do the same, but this is quite uh, at concentrations that are pretty, pretty physiological. So the first question we ask do we have PLC zeta in our fractions? So we developed two antibodies, one against the C-terminal part of the molecule and one to the N-terminal part of the molecule. The first thing that we did is we say, our antibody is specific. So we have GST, PL, uh, GST purified PLZ zeta um, from, in collaboration with Kyoko Fukami. And as you can see, the molecules here, if we treat it with antigenic peptide, the activity, the presence disappears. 
And then if we do mouse sperm and porcine sperm, the C-terminal antibody recognizes both. And actually, the mouse has splice variant. We also detect in here. So we have the fraction here. Now, what we said afterwards is the composition of the cytosolic versus the pH soluble identical. And as you can see, the molecular weight of PLG is 75 kilodaltons, present in sperm. This is pig sperm. It's present in the soluble extract, but it's completely absent in the pH extract. We then use the N-terminus antibody, and we obtain the same results. That extract, the cytosolic extract, does contain full length PLC zeta. However, it does, the pH extract does not do it. Now, as you can see it, you can see there are some degradation products. And we don't think it is, although processing may help that, but as you can see, the PLC the N-terminus antibody detects some fragments, which are even in the intact sperm. Now, we use the antigenic peptide to demonstrate whether this, all of these products are specific. And as you can see, in one-to-one -one block using the antigenic peptide, we completely remove immunogenicity. So we think, or immune reactivity. So we think these products all represent PLC zeta. Now, we said we have it in our fractions, although pH fraction doesn't have it. If we fractionate using HAP column, and then we monitor the calcium-inducing activity, Thus, the immunoreactivity activity corresponds to all the active fractions. And as you can see, fraction three has PLG zeta intact, but has no activity. Fraction four has intact PLG zeta, and it has a lot of activity, and so does fraction five. pH sperm fraction, as we knew from before, as we expected, there is no intact PLG zeta. There are these degradation products and yet the calcium activity is in a similar fractions to here. Mm -hmm. Now what we did is each of these fractions was tested for immunoreactivity, for calcium inducing activity, and for PLC activity in a calcium dependent manner. And as you can see, again, you see fraction five has the maximal activity, and again, it's at very low calcium levels. And other activities are also present, five and six, so all the, the fractions that have calcium activity have PLC activity. In the same token, the ones that do not have calcium activity do not have PLC activity. Now, this is significant, the fact that it's sensitive to such low calcium levels, because when sperm penetrates, there is no calcium increase. So the sperm is the one that triggers the calcium rise. So it has to be able to operate at PLC at very low calcium concentrations, not a molar amount. So this corroborates those that notion. The same thing with pH. We see uh, there is more constrain the activity here. It's only present in fraction five, but again, you can see there is no intact data, but certainly there seems to be some fragments, so this possibility uh, uh, have to be taken into account. So one possibility that we're entertaining is that perhaps PLC data, we do not know why this, this intact molecule here is not active, but the fact that these fragments start to accumulate in active fraction, it could suggest that protolytic processing of the molecule require, is required to trigger oscillations. Now, in the mouse, perhaps that's not true, but for example, one thing that is kind of interesting is ICSI in large domestic species does not work. So if you inject sperm, pig sperm into pig egg, it doesn't work. So one of the possibilities, yet the factor is there, because if you fuse a mouse egg, the oscillation starts. So the factor is there, possibly suggesting that you need some proteolytic fragments or proteolytic fragmentation. So the key question here, obviously, is to deplete that activity with the specific antibodies. And that's what we are doing now. We have specific antibodies and the results are in progress. In the meantime, what we found, um, luckily, is that we were testing for the action of sperm factor as a, as participating in the tyrosine kinase pathway or the SAR kinase pathway, which have been proposed by Rindy Jaffe and others to be involved potentially in sea origins, which is the case, but in mammals wasn't tested. So we used this peptide inhibitor of SARC family kinases, which blocks the activation of SARC. And as you can see, SARC is completely, when it's inactive, is folded, and it becomes unfolded when it uh, becomes activated. Now, Kenichi Sato and, and a group in COVID demonstrated that this specific peptide, which belongs to the sequence between SH3 and SH2 domains, has the ability to block the activity of this SARC kinase. The peptide A is commercially available, and it has this sequence, but they found another peptide sequence, A7, which has missed the N terminus sequence, but keeps the C terminus, and that is blocks the function. Whereas peptide A9, which is missing these three highly charged molecules, 
is an inactive control. So we took advantage of this because we knew that if we bioattenuated A7 and we mix it with sperm factor and we use beads, we spun it down, the soup, the BA, the, the BA7 or the bioattenuated A7 soup has completely lost its activity, whereas the control, the BA9, had completely activity. So what we did next is we tested whether, as you can see, the activity, as I showed you before, with A7 and A9, A7 removes the activity. You can see here 200 micromolars you need, removes completely the activity. A9 at 2 micromolars does not. And then we tested the presence in the soup of PLG zeta. And as you can see, what it, when bioattenuated A7 inhibits P, uh, the activity, it brings down PLG zeta. And the same thing is the case in the pH factor, although there is a little bit in here, but it appears to be removing some other fragment. So this suggests us that if you take out PLG set of the system, you are able to block the oscillations. Now, what we said next, can you recover the activity? So what we did is we, take, we took the uh, controls and treated beads, pelleted them, removed the activity, and now we treated the beads with potassium chloride. We suspected that the A7 peptide was binding to PLZ zeta dependent on charges. PLZ zeta has a very highly charged linker region. So between the X and Y, there are about 50 or 60 amino acids, of which 40% 40 of them are either glutamic or arginine. So we figured that, that those three amino acids, so the arginine, arginine, and glutamic acid, maybe would bind there. So we, we did that, and as you can see here, when we now take the pellet and we add two molar potassium chloride, we recover the activity. And again, you can see it here. The inactive analog did not bring down the activity. The BA7 brought down the activity, which can now can be released by potassium chloride. Furthermore, what we did, we show here that if we treat, if, if we incubate the peptide A7 with the sperm factor, with potassium chloride, now we do not bring down zeta. Zeta and its fragments stay in the supernatant. And the same thing we accomplish by mixing a peptide that has part of the linker region of PLZ zeta. We also do not bring down zeta, uh, and therefore these fractions have activity. Whereas when we just do the peptides without any of this uh, BA7, we bring down zeta and we remove it. So, we are obviously doing a lot of work now, IP in different fractions with specific antibodies. We have very promising results, but at this point I don't want to present them. But I want to tell you that we have high pH fractions that we, for the first time, recover all the calcium activity present in a sperm. And interestingly, this fraction has significantly higher calcium and PLC activity. We do not know why that is. The PLC-like activity is highly, correlates highly with calcium oscillatory activity in all uh, extracts. We need to elucidate whether these fragments are significant. As I said before, it is possible that there is a role for proteolytic fragmentation of PLC zeta during activation. And lastly, BA7, a bioattenuated peptide A7, may, may be useful to, to characterize PLCs. Now, I want to switch gears now, and I want to do a little bit of regulation of the IP3 receptor during fertilization and egg fragmentation. Now, everyone now is familiar with the fact that we have this IP3 signaling pathways. Uh, it is engaged by different systems. In our case, the sperm seems to engage it. You have PIP2, PLC, DAG, you generate IP3, and then the system triggers calcium release. John Carroll recently shows that there is activation of the PKC. The PKC goes to the membrane, potentially phosphorylates calcium stored channels. This allows calcium influx, and so on and so forth. So you have these persistent oscillations because you have potentially persistent IP3 production, emptying of the calcium stores, capacitative calcium entry then refills these stores, and then you have this cycle of oscillations that persist. Now, I, I must tell you, these oscillations in the mouse persist for four hours, in the cow and in the human, 20 hours. Uh, Tom and Stella have shown that these calcium rises trigger calm kinase activity, so there could be that there's a lot of signaling impact of these calcium oscillations. Now, one thing that has really interested us is the fact that the IPC receptor signaling in mouse eggs is very cell cycle dependent. So these are fertilized eggs and are injected here with sperm factor or with adenophosphine, which is an IP3 agonist. 
And if you inject that metaphase too, at the time of ovulation, you get beautiful oscillations. But if you inject them at interphase, you get no oscillations. Whereas if you proceed to the first mitosis, now the oscillations are also restored. So we are very interested in determining what makes this receptor so sensitive to the cell cycle because this stage here is critical for oscillation, it's critical for exit of meiosis. So whatever determines this cell cycle specificity is likely to be important for IPC receptor function. Now you say this is an easy question, but if you look at fertilization, it's a very complex set of events that take place within the first four hours. So you have a rested metaphase two, you have sperm entry, extrusion of the polar body, pronuclear formation, and mitosis. And these calcium oscillations underlie those changes. And as you can see, they occur approximately every 20 minutes for the first two hours in the mouse, but two or three hours concurrent with extrusion of the second polar body, this frequency becomes much, uh, the intervals become much greater, they cease at the time of interface, and then you have one, perhaps two, prices at the time of first mitosis. Now, concurrent with this, you have an MPF activity, which Lisa mentioned, that is important for exit of meiosis, drops approximately at the time of second polar body, and then peaks again at mitosis, first mitosis. MAP kinase then is high, remains elevated until PN formation, and then drops and remains there forever. The IP3 receptor levels slowly decline from 100% to 40% at the time of this cessation of oscillations. This is concurrent with a decrease in IP3 receptor sensitivity, which dips here at interface and then peaks again at, inter at mitosis one. And then there are two other elements that have not been clearly investigated, but certainly are important. The ER and the IP3 receptor are both distributed in, um, in um, clusters, and cortical clusters are the, at the time of meta metaphase two. They disappear into non-uniform distribution in the cytoplasm through an interface, and then the IPC receptor location is not known, but the ER goes around to next mitosis. Interestingly, PLC theta has a nuclear localization signal, actually has two, one in the EF Gantt domain and one in the linker region domain. And upon fertilization, it is completely soluble, and then at interface, at least in the mouse, it appears to localize to the nucleus. That has been suggested as one of the reasons why you don't have any more oscillations here. And then supposedly, it will become cytoplasmic again at mitosis. But because of this information here, the fact that you can inject a lot of IP3 here and you don't get oscillations, we are very interested in determining what happens to the IP3 receptor, regardless of the fact that there could be other factors that regulate this. Now, IP3 receptors are tetramers, or they're present in the ER membrane. There are three subtypes of IP3 receptors. Mouse eggs only contain IP3 receptor type one, and it's because they are super abundant products. We calculated about approximately 0.5% of the total protein in the mouse belongs to the IP3 receptor. So I'm giving you an idea of how significant this product is. Now, because it's so important, as you can see, there are multiple regulators, and this is just a not a complete depiction of the molecules that interact. But I just I want to draw to your attention to the fact that these two, these two uh, red circles here are the sites of CAM kinase phosphor uh, PKA phosphorylation. There are at least several other kinase sites in there. And look at this. The PPI, so phosphatase A1, directly interacts with the C-terminal end of the protein. And so there is a cytochrome C, which is involved in cell death. This is the channel domain, this is the ligand domain. So, because we saw such a close association between the cell cycle and the IPC receptor, we started looking around, are there consensus sequences for CDKs and MAP kinase in the receptor? And we found at least 10, but four highly conserved. And in the, at the time that we're thinking about this, a paper came out that shows some of this. So, in the, as you see, the IPC receptor has an IP3 binding domain, a regulatory domain, and a channel domain. And there are four very nicely conserved CDK or MAP kinase sites. Interestingly, there are two of them very close together. One is a CDK1, one is MAP kinase and ERK. Now, interestingly, these are only separated by 20 amino acids, and that is the typical MPN2 epitope. An MPN2 epitope, the MPN2 is an antibody that recognizes proteins in a phosphorylated specific manner, mostly mitotic proteins. 
So we will use, and I will show you some evidence to show you that this, uh, we are able to find this epitope in a cell, phosphorylated in a cell cycle specific <laughs> manner in mouse eggs. Interestingly, if you look at in here, this mouse IP3 receptor 1, human, Cenopus, Drosophila, and rat, that's type 3. You can see these sequences are completely conserved from the mouse to Drosophila. So highly conserved. Rat number, which is isoform type 3, is not conserved at all. So it suggests that these fractions are, these peptides are quite important. And we took advantage of that NPM2 antibody. And as you can see, the IP3 receptor is phosphorylated at meta phase 2, is absent at interphase. We stripped this plot and we did the IPC receptor, and you can see equal amount of protein, phosphorylated, non phosphorylated. To demonstrate that indeed this IPC receptor, we downregulated the IPC receptor with adenophosphine, and as you can see, we decreased the amount of IPC receptor signal, we decreased the amount of uh, phosphorylation signal. And recently, we just completed this study where we truly demonstrate that we can cross IP this product. <laughs> so we took Senopus egg extracts. We I immunoprecipitated with premium serum, IPC receptor antibody, phosphorylation antibody, and beads, and we IB or immunoblot with an IPC receptor antibody. And as you can see, we can IP the IPC receptor antibody with an IPC receptor antibody or with specific CDK, MAPK phosphorylation antibody, indicating that this product is phosphorylated in, even in frog eggs, so which suggests that it might have a significant impact. So we demonstrate here that an IPC receptor is phosphorylated in mouse eggs in a cell cycle stage specific manner. We do not know what kinase, but it looks like CDK and MAPK may be important. And we are in the process of trying to elucidate what is the role of IPC receptor phosphorylation and sensitivity. Now, for one last point that I want to make is that the IPC receptor mediated calcium release may not only be important for fertilization, but may be very important for cell death and for fragmentation. And there have been beautiful papers by Salomon Schneider's group showing that certainly the IPC receptor can be regulated by cytochrome C. But we published this about two years ago or three years ago, and we showed that if we inject eggs or fertilize eggs that are aged, instead of trigger normal development, what we observe is fragmentation. And you can see it's a lot of DNA fragmentation. At the same time, if you look at caspase activity, you see caspase activity. Now, we have no idea what was going on in here. We knew that calcium was given as this. And so we put together, based on some evidence from Andrew, Troma, Andrew Thomas and other people working on the IPC receptor, that actually there is such a close association between the ER and the mitochondria that the, the calcium signal can become from an activating signal to an apoptotic signal. And so what we speculated is that when the cell aged, this mitochondria is not effective anymore. So the same calcium rise that produce ATP production did not induce uh, cytochrome C release trigger activation. When this mitochondria was less than half, less than 100%, now the amount of ATP production decreased. It was, cytochrome C was released, caspase was activated, and the eggs mm -hmm. underwent apop apoptosis. In addition to that, what we saw is that fresh eggs normally oscillate. However, aged eggs stop oscillating, and the baseline increases. So we were interested in determining what is that. And to our surprise, you can see this is the sequence of the IPC receptor again. There is a caspase 3 cleavage site in there. And we look at aged eggs, and what you can see in aged eggs, we find this 95 KD fragment right in there. Now, this fragment was expressed in somatic cells and was able to induce apoptosis. So what we did is we took that fragment, that piece of IPC receptor, we made it into RNA, and we injected that. And as you can see, we, this is a control and injected egg. We injected this fragment, and we can see the 95KD product in there. When we inject in a control egg, oscillations are normal. But when we ex overexpress this C-terminus fragment, the oscillations now stop quickly, and the baseline remains elevated, exactly as you would see in an aged egg. And as you can see, these are control eggs. These are eggs just injected with this, C this fragment here, and now you induce fresh eggs to become apoptotic. So we think that IPC receptor then has a significant role in the fragmentation that you see in HAs and post-fertilization. So what we conclude here is the IPC receptor undergoes cleavage during egg aging that may underlie zygote, zygote fragmentation after activation. The expression of a C-terminal version of the IPC receptor leads to depletion of internal calcium stores. And we speculate an unregulated release of calcium, which occurs in egg aging through the IPC receptor, is one of the most important causes of fragmentation. And obviously, there are some ideas there for therapeutic treatment. 
And these are the people that work in the lab. So Bora Lee, Chris Malquit, and Su Yang are here. Uh, Marnabu did a lot of the work uh, in the characterization of uh, sperm fractions. Um, these are former students at UMass and Black help us a lot. A lot of very nice collaboration from Belgium and also from Japan uh, with Fukami, Takenawa, and Sato. And this is Thank you to the sport. Thank you very much. Well, that is an interesting I mean, it appears to be present in clusters at Metaphase 2, and actually Lisa did some of that work and with uh, Mikoshiva and that client. But there's not really good evidence of what happens after fertilization in mammals. So in frogs, there is certainly, you have it located in nice clusters. Those clusters appear to be important because they're important for propagation of the calcium wave. But as you proceed into interface in frogs, those clusters disappear. And therefore, what it disappears also is the capacity to, to develop the calcium wave. So it's very important, I think, to determine uh, what is the location post-fertilization. There is absolute evidence that a GV is completely distributed, and then it becomes nicely localized at the cortex next to the sperm. This is a comment you had a, um, a, a slide, the location of the IP3 receptor. Yes. That actually parallels pretty closely the location of mitochondria in the as well. There, there's some um, movement of mitochondria distribution across development. Mm. Very similar to that. As so, I looked up my bavister. Yeah, well, there is a very close association to the IP3 receptor on mitochondria. So the ER and the microscope, it looks like they, they, they have a lot of associations. I have a question. Uh, the the so-called the ones in the that, that are not with We activate the eggs with one, I mean, all through the species, you see a big spike of calcium, and then we just suppress all the calcium, and we do different tricks to, to bring NPF activity down. It's been shown in, in partenogenetic activation that you, if you mimic calcium, uh, like a sperm, you get better development, the Jampiro Zil paper. Mm -hmm. Now, why do you think that we can get away in nuclear transfer with just one big calcium spike and then just not having any more calcium and you still can produce some sort of offspring? I mean, of course, not normal, but... So I think Tom also will have a nice answer to that. I think there are a couple of possibilities there. So one possibility is that you only need calcium to drive down the levels of kinases. Mm -hmm. So you allow exit of meiosis. Once you did that, you're all said and done. And so you can do that either with massive calcium rise in H eggs, which is what you are having, or if they're not H eggs, you drive that with protein synthesis inhibitors or, or MAP kinase CDK inhibitors. Now, normally the sperm does it with multiple rises, and Tom and Stella have shown that each of those rises trigger CAM kinase activation. Now, the second interpretation of those results is that it could be then each of those rises code, the CAM kinase codes for different gene expression events, or at least translation. So those things need to be determined whether there is an effect or not. But that could certainly, has, in my view, it has not been demonstrated, and the negative effect of Tony cannot be attributed to poor activation. Thank you, Yes, Tom. One more, Tom. The work that's not quite published. The egg has the ability to sum calcium. And so one major rise in some measure mimics summing all the individual oscillations. But if we look at the percentage of implantation <coughs> five days after the oscillations, there's no question that the neuroimplantation sites in mice with an oscillatory pattern and with a monophonic pattern so with one single rise. So what's happening is that the cloning people are basically cheating themselves. <laughs> 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 On that note. <laughs> <laughs>